This episode is made possible by Simple Contacts. Visit the link below to save 20 bucks on your first order. For the last few decades, the threat of human-caused climate change has been heavily studied and reported. The scientific consensus is now clear, and we've seen a shift away from why is this happening to when will the worst happen, and finally now to how exactly will this happen. We know massive, potentially catastrophic changes are just around the corner, and the scientific community has shifted its attention from whether humans are exacerbating climate change to exactly what kinds of disasters to expect. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the recent IPCC climate report and break down what changes we can expect to see in the near future and beyond. Before we go any further, we need to establish a baseline for understanding. There will be climate change deniers in the comments. There always are. But these people are a very vocal minority. There is no longer any doubt that human activity has drastically affected the rate of climate change, and we have mountains of peer-reviewed evidence to prove it. If you're one of the people who believes climate change is a hoax, just consider who would benefit from you believing that lie. Fossil fuel advocates, special interest groups, and members of the current US and foreign governments who are heavily dependent on the fossil fuel industry for donations. They are selling your future and your children's future for a quick buck. Look at the evidence, do your research. This shouldn't be controversial. Every single person on Earth, regardless of political leaning or beliefs, would benefit from the actions recommended by the IPCC report. With that out of the way, let's look at the report in question. First of all, what is the IPCC? The IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Founded in 1988, the IPCC is an intergovernmental body of the United Nations, tasked with providing the world with an objective, scientific view of climate change and its various impacts. One thing to understand about the IPCC is that it doesn't conduct climate studies itself. Rather, it assesses published works from thousands of individuals and groups worldwide. These thousands of scientists contribute to the body of data on a voluntary basis, meaning none of them receive payments from any outside special interest group. When the IPCC is ready to issue a report, which includes a summary for global policymakers, the document is subjected to a line-by-line -line approval by delegates from each participating government, usually including the governments of more than 120 countries. The IPCC is the internationally accepted authority on climate change, and its reports have the agreement of leading climate scientists and each participating government. So, in short, when the IPCC issues a report, the world knows it's the real deal. That brings us to the 2018 report. You can find a link to the full document in the description below. Its full title is really long, so for the sake of brevity, we'll refer to it as SR15 or The Report. The document itself is massive. The technical summary alone is 25 pages long. The entire thing cites 6,000 scientific reports. The summary for policymakers is much more palatable, at just over 30 pages long. In it, we get what's essentially a Sparknotes version of perhaps the direst warning the world has ever received. In short, we have 12 years to drastically change the course of our future. We've already passed the point of no return to keep global temperatures below around 1 degree Celsius warmer than pre-industrial levels. The race now is to keep it from exceeding 1.5. Even half a degree's difference could make for catastrophic changes around the world. This is the part where people usually get confused. What difference does 1.5 degrees make? I get it. I live in Texas, where it can be 40 degrees in the morning and 85 by noon. But consider places where the temperature is more or less stable. Take the Arctic, or Greenland for example. Greenland is covered by a massive ice sheet that's kilometers thick in some places. In the summer, much of this ice is just barely staying frozen, and some places have even started melting. Now crank up the temperature a couple degrees Celsius. If that's enough to start a runaway melt, and the entire ice sheet melted, the sea level, on average, would rise by 7 meters. Imagine your favorite beach, underwater, coastal property destroyed, entire islands and huge amounts of coastline submerged and the millions of inhabitants forced to move elsewhere. You think your country has an immigrant problem now? Just wait until entire island nations are destroyed by the rising seas. And don't think the United States is exempt from these effects. Florida is particularly susceptible to even a small increase in sea level. Besides a third of the state potentially going under, all of its barrier islands would be well below sea level. And with them goes any protection from hurricanes. An already hard-hit state would become ground zero of increasingly powerful hurricanes. But this is all speculation, right? No one knows for sure just how many Floridians will be going for a dip in the near future. Well, SR15 has some hard numbers for us. 
The disparity in negative impacts between 1.5 degrees of warming and 2 degrees is truly shocking. At 1.5 degrees, 6% of insects, 8% of plants, and 4% of vertebrates will lose over half of their natural geographic range. At 2 degrees, those numbers increase to 18% of insects, 16% of plants, and 8% of vertebrates. 1.5 degrees is projected to destroy 90% of what remains of the world's coral reefs. 2 degrees is expected to wipe them out entirely, completely destroying one of the ocean's richest ecosystems. At 1.5 degrees of warming, we can expect to see a completely ice-free Arctic summer once every century. At 2 degrees, once every decade. Global annual catch rate for marine fisheries will drop by 1.5 million tons at 1.5 degrees, and by 3 million tons at 2 degrees. These figures go on and on, and each one could potentially trigger an avalanche of other negative effects. And we haven't even looked at the consequences for human life. It shouldn't be a surprise that the populations that will suffer the most will be the poorer and less developed countries, and those in fragile ecosystems, such as in agricultural or coastal areas. If we could limit the maximum global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius, it would drastically reduce the number of people thrust into poverty and heightened risk of climatic events by up to several hundred million by 2050. The fallout of an increase of 2 degrees for humanity sounds truly biblical. A massive increase in vector-borne illnesses like malaria, along with an expansion of their geographical range, ozone depletion, a drastic increase in heat-related mortality, huge reductions in crop yields, including maize, rice, wheat, and other cereal crops, as well as a reduction in nutritional quality, drought and famine, flooding and extreme weather, and a stagnation of economic growth to name a few. This is all very scary stuff, and it should be. We've managed to ignore the science for decades, and now it's time to pay the price. Thankfully, humans are very good at adapting and solving problems, especially if they're problems we created ourselves. We will have to deal with the long-term effects of the temperature increase we've already locked in, but we can and should do something to mitigate any further risk. The report lists a number of adaptation options for the regions who should expect serious challenges the soonest, including coastal defenses, sustainable aquaculture, and ecosystem restoration. But the truth of the matter is that we're largely at the mercy of world governments. Sure, we can stop eating meat, drive electric cars, and use less water at home, but even if every single individual did their part, it's still only a tiny step in the right direction. Just 100 companies are responsible for 71% of the entire world's carbon emissions, and just 25 of those 100 are responsible for half. As long as those companies are allowed to keep doing what they're doing, we're screwed. End of story. We could be optimistic and say, well, now that we have this report, world governments will obviously implement the necessary restrictions. Maybe in some countries, but if we've learned anything from the US in the last two years, it's that enough people in positions of power either don't believe in science or don't care about the future of their nation and the world that we've gone in the opposite direction. Legislation designed to protect the environment has been rolled back or repealed entirely, and individuals in the pocket of the fossil fuel industry are at the reins of the very groups that could enact positive change and stop this downward spiral. But say, by some miracle, the world comes to an agreement that we're going to meet the challenge to keep temperature rise below 2 degrees Celsius. What would that require? In short, the single most monumental shift in energy, public policy, personal lifestyle, and consumption habits in history we would need to transition to 100% renewable energy. Stop using fossil fuels for transportation. That means stopping production of traditional gasoline-powered cars, ships, trains, and airplanes. Stop cutting down trees and start planting them by the thousands. Stop factory farming and at least drastically reduce the world's meat intake, and hopefully transition entirely to lab-grown meats or other alternatives. If this sounds impossible and unlikely, well, that's because we've never done anything of this scale before. But it has to be done. Any of these steps on its own is a good thing, but it won't be enough. This is not something to be put off for another decade, or even another year. We as citizens of the world need to start putting real pressure on our governments now to get the ball rolling. If we don't speak up, they likely won't act against their corporate overlords. We all have to do our part by voting for candidates who support green energy goals and sustainability, and acknowledge the threat climate change poses to all of us. We have to educate friends and family who might not understand what's at stake. If we all work hard and do the right thing, we can make the world a safe place for future generations. It's easy to see that climate change is a real challenge, but if you're like me, it's hard to see anything without your contacts. If you wear contacts and find yourself dreading that annual appointment to renew your prescription, then you're going to love Simple Contacts. It's a great new company that makes this annoying process simple. Simple Contacts lets you renew your expired contact lens prescription and reorder your brand of lenses from your phone or computer in minutes. Simple Contacts brings the doctor's office to you. 
whenever you need it. You can take their vision test online in five minutes. A real doctor reviews it, and if your vision hasn't changed, renews your prescription. You save time, save money, and save yourself a headache. If you already have an unexpired prescription, just upload a photo of it or your doctor's info and order your lenses in minutes for a great price. They do all the hard work for you. Simple Contacts offers every brand of lenses and their prices are unbeatable. The prescription is only 20 bucks and shipping is free. Best of all, fans of Second Thought can get $20 off their first Simple Contacts order. Just go to simplecontacts.com slash secondthought or enter the code secondthought at checkout. I want to mention that this isn't a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam. You still need those occasionally. But it is the most convenient way to renew a prescription and reorder your contacts if your vision hasn't changed. So, check out Simple Contacts and get $20 off by going to simplecontacts.com slash secondthought, or just enter the code secondthought at checkout.